Hi, this is Honey German, and welcome to CEO Unplugged. Today, I'm sitting down with Royce Russell, criminal attorney and civil rights attorney and author of Cardiac Arrest. How are you today? I'm doing fine. Thank You're you. Doing Thank good? you for asking. I was online. I was looking at the book because I like to research everybody that I'm going to sit down with. And this is amazing. The fact that I didn't know this book existed it, it drives me crazy because this is a topic that I talk about all the time with my friends, with my family, you know, and behind closed doors. What actually prompted you to put this book together? Well, as you can see by looking at me, I'm an African-American male, mm -hmm. right? And growing up in New York City and in the Bronx, uh, there was a time and period and place where there was what we call community policing. Police officers knew you, you kind of knew them. And it didn't matter where you were from. I grew up in St. Mary's in the Bronx, uh, working to low working class. You still had an officer that recognized you and you recognized them, wanted good things for you. You wanted good things for them, but as time moved on, uh, it appears that policing has moved away from that. Mm -hmm. And now it's more, to my view, is more of an occupying force where there is no community policing. I don't know the police officer, the police officer doesn't know me. So over a period of time, you see the engagement become more and more hostile. So having those experience as a young man, as a middle-aged man, as an attorney, and seeing far too many lives lost, uh, litigating far too many cases where someone has been a victim of excessive force has led me to write Cardiac Arrest. Now, the title of the book. Oh, yes. We have to talk about that. It's crazy because when I got it, I said, oh, he must be a doctor or he must be a heart <laughs> surgeon. But then when I looked at it, it made total sense. What's the complete title of the book? Well, it's called Cardiac Arrest, mm -hmm. a tactical guide on how to handle unlawful police stops. And as attorneys, we like to play with words. And, I see. Uh, we try to uh, illustrate and display our command of the English language. And so Cardiac Arrest is a play on words. Um, it's actually reality to most people. Um, it is the type of feeling that you feel when police are stopping you, whether you're driving mm -hmm. in a car and you see the police in your It's a mini heart attack right away. Without a question. Immediately. Either one or two things. Your heart stops or your heart begins to pump erratically mm -hmm. and your blood pressure goes up. And if you're hopeful, you won't get arrested, but most times you wind up getting arrested. Yeah. So it's a combination of the two. Now, what do you think changed? You know, we talked about community policing and the fact that now it, it's, it's we're more targets than anything else. You know, I, I personally don't see police as someone that's trying to help me. It's actually become something that me, my husband, my friends, we've become more most fearful of. Like, we don't want to have any police interaction. Where do you think that disconnect came where cops were no longer interested in the well-being of the community and we became pretty much black and brown targets to them? Well, I think it's the overall tone and tenor of America right now mm -hmm. um, but if we look beyond who's president and we look beyond politics I think what I reiterate what I stated before is basically when you don't live in the community when you don't have a connection with the community uh, then you have a disregard for the community um, and what you see in that in that respect is that I just work here mm -hmm. this is what I do this is a career so yet so then you're an object you're not a person and then you could filter in a variety of things. Within the book, I talk about four different groups. You could talk about the prejudice police officer, mm -hmm. which we know just deals with on a color basis. Mm -hmm. Black, white, I'm black, you're white, you're white, I'm black. And so therefore, there's going to be disparate treatment. Uh, we have to recognize, despite what any uh, police commissioner, chief, inspector tells you, there is a de facto quota system. Uh, there is no job where you don't earn bonus points to, pro to get promoted. Uh, if I am a vacuum clean sell salesperson, the more vacuums I sell, the higher I rise. Mm -hmm. And the same thing here within the police department. The more summonses, the more arrests, whether good or bad, the higher I rise. There is a classism part of policing where if I am of a middle class and you of a lower class, the lower class doesn't have a right. Or in reverse, I'm working hard as a police officer. It takes a lot for me to get overtime. It takes a lot for me to make uh, my paycheck. And yet we have a variety of middle class uh, Latinos and African-Americans driving around in their daddy's car, which is very nice, <laughs> or drinking Starbucks. Yeah. Uh, and, and there could be some resentment towards that. And then we have what we call a power police officer, which is just a person that doesn't know how to use their power correctly. There is abuse of power. So... 
I think there not being a residency requirement, yeah. therefore not creating a relationship and using that broad brush to kind of look at what's underneath policing creates the 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 dissension. It's crazy that you mentioned all those things, all those things, because sometimes I see cases like, let's say, um, I believe it was an Asian officer and he was in the projects. And he ended up shooting a man that was coming down the steps. In Brooklyn, yeah. And immediately I thought, they're afraid of us. They're afraid of us. Without a question. This is the reason why. And they shouldn't have people policing us that are prejudging us. And just the sight of one of us makes them shoot us. And and it's crazy that you say that they're not from our community. They they don't understand the they don't understand us. And and there is also the resentment factor that you mention. And I talk about that all the time. Me and my friends, we all work hard. We all buy nice things. And there are certain cars that certain friends of mine own that they're like, I always get pulled over, and cops are always mad that I own this car. Yeah, I I, I would agree with you one hundred percent. And I don't want to make it simplistic because we can then talk about. Well, well I'm just no 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 not yeah, that you yeah, are, yeah. but. In, in peeling back the onion and the mm-hmm. layers, we also know that there's implicit bias yeah. within cultures, right? There's implicit bias despite the fact that you might not feel that you're prejudiced or racist. Mm-hmm. But when you talk about training and yeah. you talk about the different cultures, you cannot assimilate running up a stair staircase mm-hmm. in St. Mary's Project or in Brownsville or you, you just can't unless you're that. from there. Unless you're from there, yeah. right? And if you grew up there, you ran up plenty of stairs and you know that the... A staircase is the staircase to take, and the B staircase is the staircase <laughs> not to take, right? I mean, we know that, right? I feel you, yeah. And so, and without having that backdrop, yeah. all of it is fear, right? It all is. of it is fear, and the sensitivity is great, and the intensity is great, and police overall try to do a great job. Mm-hmm. However, the reality is, is that if you're scared, you're scared. Yeah, and you're going to be reactive, Without a question. Now, this um, this guide, I know it was inspired by a young lady who was, you know, unlawfully detained and, and, and handcuffed, you know, at a train station, which is something I do every single day. Right. Is this guide uh, for any gender, for any age, for any person that lives? No, in- it is it is gender neutral. OK. Um, I think the stories that I try to tell mm-hmm. uh, might be cultural, cultural sensitive to, mm-hmm. s- to a certain degree, because yeah. I'm speaking from a perspective of what I've seen as an attorney in mm-hmm. my uh, formative years of growing up in New York City. Uh, but the storyline, the essence of what you should and should not do goes for men, go for women, go for Latino, goes for African-American, goes for Jamaican, Haitian, you name it across yeah. the board. Um, and I think that should be the to take away. Um, when you mentioned uh, the story of the 13 year old uh, young woman that was arrested at the train station, that happened in the 80s. Um, when we think about music, you know, KRS One, that happened, those songs were in the 90s. Yeah. And now we're in 2019, and whether we listen to A Boogie, who talks about the police, <laughs> or whether we listen to any other rapper out here, the conflict and the strained relationship still exists. And now it exists on a higher level because, one, um, we're not taking it anymore. We're not. Two, social media media has made it more open so we can see it. And three, the resistance from police to be accountable and responsible when they see that something is wrong. The, The words, and I'll make this analogy, when you're married and you come home and you get in that argument and you know you're wrong, it seems like the words to say I'm sorry is really hard to come by. It is sometimes. Right? Everybody wants to stay in their ground. And so what I see playing out in the media and playing out in the society is that you have an agency that wants to stay in their ground and not really accept that, you know, wait a minute, you know what? When that person is asking me why am I being arrested, that probably comes across to the police officer as you challenging them as to whether or not they're right or wrong, Mm -hmm. when only thing you're doing is asking a question. Why? Now, we can agree to disagree, Mm -hmm. but that has happened throughout life. Now, what are some steps that I can take? Let's say I am just driving my car and two cops come up. What What are things that I am within my own right to do to say, do I have to stay there? Do should I let them search my car? Like, what are my rights as a citizen when I am coming into contact with police? So let's say you're driving, right, and you are the only one in the car, mm-hmm. and it's late at night, yeah, and the area is kind of dim. 
first thing I would suggest. Now, let me pre- preface this by saying there is no one rule. Okay. I'm giving a variety of rules. I'm giving a variety of tactics. It's a tactical guide. Yeah. It is not a guarantee, but we need to start somewhere. Of course. Right? So yeah. let's start here. So you're driving middle of the night or early morning. Um, you don't feel safe stopping and pulling over. Mm-hmm. And you say, well, if I keep on driving, that's going to agitate the police. It is. Uh-huh. Right? And if I stop, I'm afraid for my own safety. I am. Tip. As you're driving on your handheld free phone, because you're not supposed to have your phone in your hand, mm-hmm. uh, you call 911 and you say, hey, a police officer car, a police officer car, vehicle, unmarked car is following me. I'm at this location. I want to pull over at this location. And you give that address. So you say, why is that helpful? Or why should I do that? Two reasons. One, it creates what we call an ear witness. Okay. Now you have somebody on the other end. Listening that in. radio, that's transmitted. That's the 911, that's all over. So now you have someone putting you in a place and a time as to what happened. Two, the people or the police officers in that other vehicle, because it's a radio transmission, that 911 operator or PA has an obligation to put it over the air. Oh, okay. They should receive that in some shape, form, or fashion. So the hostility should be decreased. Now, it still may be there, right? Mm-hmm. Because they may say, well, why is she uh, on the air talking about us? We didn't do anything wrong. And the words are, hey, look, for, sa- for safety reasons, yeah. I am pulling over. And I want it to be noted that I'm not fleeing. I am just pulling over. So that lessens the anxiety from your perspective. That gives you a witness from your perspective. If you don't think about that, what you should do is call someone that you may think that is home. Pull over immediately if you if you think it's safe. And have that person, once again, become an ear witness. You tell them, I'm going to put the phone on speaker. I'm going to black it out. You don't say anything. You let me do the talking. So when the officer comes over, you say, how you doing, Officer Jones? Or how can I help you, Officer Jones? It doesn't hurt to be polite, but the key is to get Jones' name to the other person. Got it. Okay. The key is not to ask for a shield, but memorize the shield. And when the officer goes away, you tell the person that is listening, the number is 251904. Then you can concentrate on other things rather than trying to concentrate on a shield, trying to see what the person yeah. looked like. You look over to the partner that's over by the other side on the passenger side. You may see a shield there and you say that. But you need to do that before you actually stop because you don't want to move while you're stopped mm-hmm. because you don't want them to use the famous I fear for my safety. So that's one tip. Now, is it ever good to record the police? It's always good to record the police. As a matter of fact, in New York City in particular, and once again, you have to go state by state, is within the patrol guide that you can record the police. Wow. And the only thing you have to do if you're a civilian and you're watching someone else in an altercation. Which I have done before. Right. Or Mm -hmm. a victim of excessive force or force arrest. If the police officers tell you to stand back, you just need to stand back. If they say move back, you just need to move back. But if you're the victim or the potential victim, you can record immediately. And that's within the patrol guide in New York City. That's amazing. Now, something that um, came to mind right away, is this something that should be, you know, discussed with police officers during their training academy? Like better ways of policing the community and better ways of interacting with us. Is this something that's being taught or something that should be taught? I can tell you I don't believe it's being taught. Because if it was, I wouldn't be sitting here with with you in this interview. Yeah. I'll be over there teaching. It. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's the reality. Um, I, I'm sure there is some form of it. Is it more on an academic level as opposed to a, a realistic level? Mm-hmm. Um, we'll never know because they don't let us into those doors. See, part of the issue is lack of transparency. Yeah. If we had transparency, then we would know more. For example... If you knew that it is protocol for a police officer to have his hand on his gun and have his hand on a flashlight when they stop you in a vehicle, just because they don't know who you are and Mm -hmm. what you have, then that may lessen your either animosity, your anxiety as to why the officer has his hand on the gun. What do you think? I'm going to do something? Yeah. Which is the posture that sometimes we take because of the long lasting relationship, which is bad. So that lack of transparency 
creates another dangerous situation. Now, speaking of, of relationships and of officers, I saw that the foreword to your book was, was written by a retired NYPD um, officer or detective. Right. You guys are friends for so many years. Correct. Now, when you get together and, and talk about these things, does he have hope for our police and their relationship with the community? Does he see things changing since he was once an insider? Or does he feel like this is it and we're just going to have to deal with it? I would say yes and no. Um, yes in that he, those retired officers have laid the foundation to train other officers mm -hmm. throughout their 21, 20 years of experience working on the force. So they have left some mentees along the way to say this is how you should treat people. Mm -hmm. This is how you should go about policing. No in that what we see is a police force that is younger and younger. Yeah. What we see a police force that, as far as academia is concerned, um, it is void. As far as cultural experiences, it is void. What we see is a police force that hasn't fully embraced uh, what we call psychological uh, reevaluations every eight months, every two years, every six months, mm -hmm. where if you see enough in the community, you might be a little emotionally damage a little bit yeah. and what we don't see is enough discipline now the city i wouldn't say easily but they do pay out you could walk away with a million dollar oh i've, you I've know, seen it all the know, time verdict right yeah, I've, eric I've, garner's family right, got a right, verdict right. recently you know, yeah. i've negotiated those day and night yeah. but what you won't see is someone being terminated what you won't see is someone being suspended and everyone know about it what you won't see is when the incident occurs again, instead of putting the victim's history, criminal history, whether they have one or not, because sometimes it's just bad moral conduct that shows up on the news screen, mm -hmm. you don't see that of the officers. Oh, never. And so once we have that type of communication, then we'll be in a better place. And then we could really talk about how effective um, our work my work, your work in the media, uh, other activists' work out there is penetrating and trying to make a place, this world, a better place. Now, let's talk about Think Calm. Yes. What exactly does this mean, and, and how can I put this into, I guess, uh, in, into practice? Well, first, let me give you our famous, famous silicone bracelet. It's right here which on one side says cardiac arrest, which is the name of the book. Okay. And on the other side, it has what you said, Think Calm. And Think Calm are just, once again, tools of the trade uh, that you should use at the time that you're stopped, whether it is unlawfully or lawfully. And so, as we say, Think Calm. C, stay composed. Even though it may be hard to do, that's the posture that we need to take. That is our responsibility, Yeah. right? I'm not saying it's easy, but you have to do it because Royce Russell, the attorney, needs certain information in order to pursue any type of lawsuit. I need the name. I need the shield. I need the complexion. I need the precinct. I need the car license plate. Got it, yeah. I need that. You can't give me that information if you're not composed. So you need to stay composed. Next one is to be aware that A, and calm, be aware. Be aware that, hey, look, if I pull over in this dim lit area, mm -hmm. that's not good news. Be aware that, hey, look, maybe the bodega has a camera. Maybe the, the, the lighting post that is put up that NYP or any other precinct puts up to traffic and kind of look at whether or not criminality is happening on the corner mm -hmm. can serve as your witness as to what happened to you. That's a good point. So you yeah. need to be aware. Where are the cameras? Listen. Now, listen is a tricky one because many people think listen means, oh, you just want to listen to what the officer says. You need to do a little bit of that, mm -hmm. but you really need to listen to what he's saying about you or about the circumstance. For instance, Sergeant, I really don't know what we're going to do with this person. What do you want me to charge him with? Excuse you? Right. <laughs> um, Billy, why don't you go back and run the license plates? Well, now you know the officer's name is Billy. Yeah. Or Officer Johnson. Or, man, we stopped you because there was a shooting on 116th Street. Well... I happen to be on Fordham Road in the Bronx. Like, how does that correlate to me? Yeah. Right? And make a call. Now, this is really, really tricky in the day and age of technology. Mm -hmm. 
How can you make a call if you don't memorize any phone numbers? I'm going to tell Alexa, Siri, somebody calling somebody. <laughs> so now here you are. You stopped. You can't get to your phone. You have someone that's walking by. Yeah. And you're at a place that, hey, look, you know what? I'm going to forget about being vulnerable. I need some help. Yeah. So you want to tell somebody, hey, please call. Please yeah. call who? Mom? They don't know what mom number is. Yeah. Call Robbie, my boyfriend. They don't know who Robbie is. So we have to commit to at least memorizing one telephone number. I have four. All right. So at least one. Yeah. So when they stop, hey, can somebody please call 718? And it's crazy because community, we're here to help. Like if I see any type of weird interaction, I'm going to chill. I'm going to see what's happening. I need to record. I'm going to hold you down. As you said, we're we're revolting. Right. We're and, not we're protect, and we're protecting. And we're we protecting are. ours. Right. We are. And so if I'm the bystander and I go, who you want me to call? And you're like, well, it's in my phone. No. We got a problem, right? <laughs> yes, we so do. So we have to memorize a number. And this is not on uh, our, our bracelet, but I think starting now, you need to have a relationship with an attorney just like you have a relationship with your doctor. Wow, okay. Right? You don't need to go to the attorney and say, here go $5,000. When I call you, you better run. Yeah. But what you need to do is have a relationship. Know who you're going to call. Have the card on the refrigerator. Have it in your phone. Have it in your wallet. It could only... We love saying, I'm going to call my lawyer. Right. Right? We all, we all have somebody somewhere. <laughs> and it free, it's, 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 a, it's a freezing point, mm -hmm. right? At that point that the illegal stop leads to your personal property being searched and they see the card, Royce Russell, well, now they have to make a real decision. Well, can I tell them, like, you cannot search my car? You definitely can. What I will say is that you have to be prepared for the marathon and not the sprint. So you can't say you can't search my car and then expect for them to say, all right, well, keep on going now. We'll talk to you later. Have a nice day, right? lady. Right? So you have to be prepared for the marathon. Yeah, so the yeah. marathon is this. Oh, we can't search your car? Okay, so why don't you have a seat on the sidewalk? We'll get the dogs over. Now you're there. 45 minutes turned to an hour <sighs> we and a half. Can't win. Now the dogs come. <laughs> oh, I think the dogs smell something. All right, so now we process you, right? You know you don't have any drugs. You know there's I nothing know, illegal, I right? Know. So now you four hours in the precinct, and then they let you out the back door, or they give you the pink slip saying disorderly conduct, and you like, I did nothing disorderly. I know, right? I know. So I'm fine with that. Yeah. And I would advocate that we run the marathon instead of the sprint, but sometimes, you know, <laughs> sometimes we want to get home and we just say, you know what, we live to see another day. But that's why having the edicts of think calm is important because- I was just going to say then, that. Let me stay calm. Yeah, right. You can <laughs> file afterwards, whether that's with the Civil civil Complaint Review Board, whether that is actually filing a lawsuit, we can, we can redress your forced attention. Now, another thing um, that I wanted to talk to you about, what prompted you to want to translate the guide into Spanish? Oh, come on. I am Spanish, don't you know? I know. Yeah, I am. What? If you grew up in the Bronx, you're Spanish. What are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> and if you, grew up in, if you grew up in St. Mary's, you're definitely Spanish. <laughs> Look, um, I don't see a division in community. Same. You know, I grew up, like I said, in St. Mary's Project in the Bronx. I went to a school called St. Anselm's, and I probably was the only black person at the school, all my friends were Latino. You know, Alfredo, Willie, Nelson, Jose, you name it. You Puerto Rican. You know, <laughs> yeah, I mean, so, so I couldn't see it any other way. Got it. So as far as I am concerned, um, it is one language, but noting, it's almost like a relay. And what I would say, and this, it, and I really mean this sincerely, African Americans are running the first leg we hit all the trials and tribulations first. You did. Right? And, and I and I just recently talked about that. Right. So we yeah. hitting, we hitting it first, mm -hmm. right? And then we see our Latino people ahead. And we got the baton. And we like, not that we're not going to hit those bumps again, but we see you ahead. Mm -hmm. We're like, here you go. Boom. You grab it. Now you're running. We are entering an age, and you could really look at the Bronx, and you can look at some other areas. And you look around the United States, you go to Miami, et cetera, where the Latino diaspora is rising politically, socially, mm -hmm. economically. And there's no distinction. They're going to hit the same bumps. But who's speaking to that? Who's speaking to that culture? Well, if nobody's going to speak to it, I'll speak to it. I have no issues with that. I'm speaking to them too. <laughs> My Spanish is limited, but you know, all the bad <laughs> words I got, but you know, 
So that's we'll dope. So you, you just pretty much fuck connected. Like black and brown is all one. It's one connection. And if you're going to give it to to the blacks, you're going to give it to the Hispanics. It, it's one connection. I don't see any. No, and that's super dope. And, and, and we appreciate it because, you know, Hispanic people not only um, have the language barrier at times, sometimes they have the barrier of their citizenship not being in order. Correct. And that creates more fear. And, and you know, a lot of in a lot of Spanish Hispanic neighborhoods, you know, there is a lot of issues and there is a lot of issues with the police and, and this will definitely um, be very welcomed now. And I've been on that side, having worked for the Department of Justice and Immigration. Mm -hmm. I've been on that side where we actually had to deport people. But now on this side, I make sure that they can stay. That's amazing. I love that. Now, what are the after an unlawful stop or after a false arrest or use of excessive force, what are the next steps that you need to take as a citizen in order to, you know, get this ball rolling, get justice, you know, be given your day in court or get paid for, you know, your rights being violated and you be thrown in jail unlawfully? What are the first steps that, that you take? Well, the first thing you have to realize, as I stated before, it is a marathon and there's a method to why you have to keep on coming back to court and the case is adjourned and mm -hmm. the case is adjourned because it is used to wear you out. Because once you plead guilty, then your false arrest, your false detention case goes to the wayside. So we never want to plead guilty. You, there are if we're not guilty. There, well, you definitely don't want to plead guilty if you're not guilty, but there are certain circumstances. Scenario number one, you know you've been falsely arrested. Mm -hmm. You should never plead guilty. But sometimes, That's, but sometimes we do. Well, this is what I talk about the marathon, right? So you have to be willing to know that you're going to miss days of work. Mm -hmm. You have to be willing to set up child care. You have to be willing to say, you know what? I'm not pleading to a violation. This case needs to be dismissed. You have to have the fortitude to do that. That's one. That's one form of false arrest, uh, civil rights violation. The other is, let's say you did have a marijuana joint on you, a blunt. You had something that was illegal, but was not threatening. And you're a victim of excessive force. So let's say you come to my house, uh, domestic violence, you ask me to leave. We have a verbal altercation. Next thing you know, I leave with a broken eye socket, right? Well, my domestic violence case is not gonna go anywhere because mm -hmm. that's not really against the police. But however, the excessive force is still there. So it may, it determine, it is determined by the facts and you may sometimes be able to plead guilty and not affect your case if it's an excessive force case. So they they may have had a legal right to stop you, but they definitely did not have a right to beat you. Got it. So being able to determine, you know, all, all and all that's that. why you need to have that relationship to make that phone call to say, hey, Mr. Russell, this is what happened to me. Hey, Mr. Jones, this is what happened to me. Look, legal aid neighborhood defenders is overwhelmed with cases mm -hmm. and a majority of them do a f very, very good job. But they're not thinking about your civil lawsuit. No, you yeah. have to think about your civil yeah, that, lawsuit. That's you on the side. And you have to communicate to them, hey, look, I do not want to plead guilty, no matter how nice it sounds, no matter the fact that I don't have to return. I need to take this from A to Z. And I need for you to help me. Now, if people want to get the book or if people want you to help them with a particular case, where can they go? Well, clearly you can reach me by way of Internet, Royce Russell ESQ. Uh, you okay. can also uh, plug into rsquareesq at gmail.com. Okay, that's your email. Right. Okay. Uh, I, I can be reached at 718-292-1244. There you go. That's 718-292-1244. Four, four. You can also go to our website, cardiacarrestbooklaunch.com. You can always go to that. You can always go to, you can buy and purchase the book from cardiacarrestbook.net. Uh, you can also purchase the book on Amazon. And this is the book right here to your side? That is correct. This is a good book. It, it, it's nice and handy. It feels like something that I can carry with me. Well, that was the purpose, to, to make it small so smart. that you can put in your back pocket, <laughs> you can put in your glove compartment. Um, it is very flexible. We want you to use it, abuse it, bend it, fold it, and as we say. And let everybody borrow it. And, and, and <laughs> I must say, from my friends back in the old neighborhood, mm -hmm. they said, Royce, you know what? We're going to give you a little something. And I, and I was wondering, what are you talking about, right? And this guy named Wayne Will, he said, hey, look, I want you to use this whenever you're talking about the book. And I said, what it is? What is it, brother? And he said, um, 
tell your audience they need to read something before they need something. And that was the bottom line. That's good. You got to be prepared. If I don't know what's in this book, when I get pulled over, I have some weird interaction with the police. I won't know what to do. Right. I'm keeping this. You know this. So right? read okay. before you need. I need this autograph. You know this. Right? <laughs> I will. I'll do that right now. <laughs> thank you so much for coming in. No, thank you for it having me. It was an amazing me. conversation. Much needed. Um, thank you for doing this. Thank for all the. Thank you for all the work that you, that you've done and that you are currently doing right now because you know we need this and and most importantly um i want to say thanks on on the behalf of the latino community oh, for translating this book you know and giving us all these gems because uh trust me we we definitely definitely need it well i appreciate you uh having me here and mucho gracias well, okay you see you pulled out the spanish on me this was ceo unplugged Thank you to um, Royce Russell for coming in. He's doing amazing work. He's a civil rights attorney. He's a criminal attorney. And he is the author of this amazing book that we all need to pick up and should be in every black and brown home. We need to teach our kids this. Oh, I'm without teaching a question. my kids this. And, Trust and, me. And, and I'm sorry. Let me just say one more thing. Bring it back. Right? Um, we have conversations about the birds and the bees. Mm -hmm. We have conversations about don't do drugs. Yeah. We have a conversation about no means no. That is a conversation. Cardiac arrest. 100%. What to do. It's something that we kind of don't have the conversation, either because kids, men, women, whatever age, whatever demographic thinks that is part of life. So they don't mention it. No. Or we fail as a family and as a community to have the conversation and be proactive. This is all about being proactive and protecting our of community. Of course it is. That's what this is all this about. This should be discussed at our dinner table. Without a question. When our sons go out into the streets, when they take a bus, when they are walking up a regular block, they should know how to act when they come into any contact with police. And our sisters, because... Uh, I think there's no discrimination. There's no oh, gender course discrimination. Oh, there is not. They will manhandle us with no problem. That's right. And we need to know how to handle these unlawful police stops. So thank you once again for having thank me. Thank you for coming in.